I'm really coming back to those values that I learned uh, from a very young age. And I actually call it the, the three C's. I wrote like a list of goals and I still have that. And I do it in some of my presentations where, you know, I had like kind of a four year plan when I was younger. So about goal setting and um, again, like not, not buying soccer jerseys and, and then that sticks in your mind to when to, to, to try and believe that, that, that you want to um, get achieve that result, you know. Welcome to the Cultural Things Podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Rogers, and this is episode 52. And today I'm talking with a fellow who needs very very little introduction from myself, but I'll give a little bit of a, a summary of where he's at. So he's an ex-Socceroo footballer, um, he's played in Europe, played in Asia, played for a number of A-League teams, started his career professionally in the NSL with Marconi Stallions in Sydney, started his um, young footballing days. He's a boy from Cairns. Uh, he's a man after my own heart as well. He's a Broncos supporter and he's a Queenslander. And I love those two. Uh, I love the Broncos and I'm a passionate Queenslander as well. So Michael Thwaite, welcome to the Culture of Things podcast. Thank you very much, Brennan. So mate, can you just give me a, a little bit of, I've given you, a, you know, the audience a little bit of background and how about you share of a few of your sort of career highlights for you through your footballing journey, mate, so we can get started there. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I grew up in Cairns, far north Queensland, uh, and I left Cairns when I was about 18 um, after my first university and, uh, yeah, transferred on, on scholarship to Sydney University. And because of my scholarship, I ended up having to play for the university team for the first six months. And, um, yeah, an ex, ex-coach of mine, uh, Raul Blanco, was actually look at, looking at um, Daniel Schwarzer, who's Mark Schwarzer's brother. And Sydney University were playing against Fraser Park. And that 90 minutes changed my life, really. Um, and I got invited to trial with Marconi back in the old NSL. And uh, within six weeks, I was in the in the first team there, which was a big goal of mine. Um, yeah, so pretty much in the, in the space of four years, I went from being at my second schoolies outside of, Scan- outside of Cairns uh, to, to being a Socceroo um, a, a few years after that, uh, you know, after... The NSL finished, uh, I went to Europe and then back in the A-League and uh, now full circle pretty much to back at Gold Coast United and um, this is my first year actually not playing. So it's a little bit different. I'm still training to try and keep fit. Um, but yeah, just trying to be 100% there for my family um, after a big journey, as you just mentioned, and yeah, just giving back uh, to the community as as um as not just a player, um, as learning as a coach, uh, doing disability work um, outside of football as well. And yeah, just trying to really get that balance back to the, to the family a lot. Yeah. Well done, mate. I know that when I did some reading up on you, you've made some statements about in your second life being a slave. You want to expand on that a little bit? (laughs) Yeah, I guess uh, I've been away a lot, you know, as a, as a professional footballer for, 18 years, you know, every second weekend, you're pretty much away. Um, you know, it's almost like working in the mines or something like that. Um, and particularly in my last two years, fully professional in China and at West Sydney Wanderers in 2018, I lived two full years away from my family. Um, and I could yeah, virtually count on my fingers the days that I saw my family. So I said, you know, once I did come back and play semi-professionally in the last two years with United, um, yeah, I, I made the statement that I'd probably be my wife's slave um, for the rest of life. But I guess that's marriage in general. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, mate. You said it. Now, I, I haven't got this photo to bring up, unfortunately, but I do remember seeing you dressed up in your pre-game football gear, I think Gold Coast United, and going to Swan Lake before football. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, it's true. It's it's very hard to balance. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any future Matildas. I've got two young daughters. Uh, one's a horse rider and one's a ballerina. So that's my weekends as well. And that's one of the reasons why I'm not playing this year for Gold Coast United um, and, and just training and, and helping and, and announce my retirement is because I just want to be there because uh, it's a lot of running around, as you know, with children. And um, it's it's yeah, it takes its toll. And 
yeah, it's not right for one person to, to have to do that in my wife and, and, and she's working, she's a sonographer as well. So she's, she's in medical and very busy as well. So it's always hard to balance as a parent, let alone, you know, single parents out there. So, um, yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons why I did come back as well. And, uh, yeah, made that sacrifice for, for the family. Yeah, mate. Is, is it Porsche or Madeline doing the horse riding? Cause that's a really expensive hobby. <laughs> yeah. Well, Porsche does horse riding and dancing. Uh, she's oh. particularly focused on jazz, but yeah, my little nine-year-old does uh, ballet. She's more focused on the classical type of thing. But yeah, they could have chosen a, a yeah, certainly a lot less cheaper sports. But I guess yeah, you do anything, and and it's you know we didn't really force it on them. Um, they they kind of came up with it, and and it's their kind of passion. Like like I when I first started when I was seven um, as a soccer mm. player with my dad first time me up in Cairns so what can you do mm. you just go with the flow absolutely mate absolutely you give your kids every opportunity as best you can don't you yeah we try we try <laughs> mate what I just want you to take your mind back to I guess do you remember when you were a young fella and playing at Saints Football Club up in Cairns where you were born when you really wanted started thinking about wanting to play for the Socceroos playing for your national team yeah, it was around 12 years old. Um, back in the old NSL, uh, I used to support a team who's playing in, in the NPL now is Brisbane Strikers. And they actually won the championship in 97, um, you know, back in the day. And uh, Frank Farina, um, which was one of my best friend, best friend Zenon's uncle, um, yeah, he, he was an icon of Australia, as you know. And, uh, yeah, he was an you know, icon of that region as well, far north Queensland, because so he, he grew up there and left quite late as well um and yeah so that he really inspired me to become professional and it's from that moment from about 12 years old that's when i started writing goals and getting involved in queensland teams and and, and things like that where you know you can see well you, you're starting to use your ability um and yeah so this yeah around that 12 years old fantastic mate let's dive into a little bit around these values and leadership because you said you mentioned captaining various sides and, and making your way through Queensland sides. What are the values that have driven you along the way in your journey as a footballer and as a person? Yeah, it's something like I'm 38 now. Um, so obviously I've been playing uh, pretty much 30 years of my life, which is which is every weekend. Um, and I'm really coming back to, you know, I'll call it a midlife crisis or whatever. I'm really coming back to those values that I learned uh, from a very young age. And I actually call it the the three C's. So I call it uh, uh, communication, compromise, and commitment, and an element of surprise, which is the S. Um, so those values I go by every day, and um, and I and I bring those values on the pitch and off the pitch. So um, to give an example, on the pitch, you know, as long as I'm committed to a tackle, I know you know you're probably not going to get injured, and you're going to most likely win the tackle. As long as I'm communicating around the field with my centre back partner or the people in front of me or my coach, um, you know that you're going to have success and and also compromise. So if my partner makes a mistake, you know I've got to cover for that person. And the element of surprise, like something that a coach doesn't teach you, you know, like it might be a last minute winner in the 90 30 minute, or it might be saving a goal on the line. That something that comes from within, you know. So. And then off the pitch, I use those same values, um, you know, in my relationships with my wife, you know, whether it be I'm talking, she says I talk too much with the communication and uh, also listening as well, but uh, also being committed to that relationship uh, and compromise. For example, this afternoon, my wife is at work, so uh, I can't, you know, she can't pick up the kids. So I have to, I have to do that. And I've actually got her some flowers uh, today because tomorrow is my 14th year anniversary. Uh, so it's an, that's my element of surprise, something that she doesn't expect, but she doesn't know that yet until she sees it this afternoon. Congratulations on your wedding anniversary tomorrow for tomorrow, mate. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. But yeah, that, so that, in a nutshell, they're my values that I go by. And um, yeah, in a le leadership sense, I think, um, yeah, that's what I use as a leader as well. So it's also you got to believe in what you're, you're doing as well, because if you don't believe in those values or the company values, then you know the relationships are going to suffer mm. how, how did the, how did you get to that point you've articulated those really really well the communication the compromise commitment and the surprise angle 
have you thought back about how you've got to that angle now where you can really articulate those so clearly? Because that's a real journey for leaders to know what they stand for. Yeah, I guess it's, first of all, it's, it's experience, you know, seeing what how my my parents' relationship works, seeing, you know, my wife, parents and, and experienced people, even my grandparents, um, seeing, seeing what works and what breaks down. I mean, and, and those things are an everyday thing, you know, one, one day, you know, your partner or, or your boss uh, might want to com- communicate. You know, I know in disability world, um, sometimes they're not verbal and, uh, you know, you can't communicate with them. You've got to find out different ways. So um, there's lots of gray area with that. But, yeah, it's something that I've learned over time and, and, and I find that when one of those things are missing, then the relationship suffers or is broken. And, uh, yeah, that's that's what I found in a leadership sense. And, uh yeah, the main thing is is actioning them, you know, like and and as a leader and and building that culture, which is basically a relationship between people, um, is you know you got to build those things. So, and and I think you know, it can almost be like a fulcrum uh, for for companies, um, because obviously the the stronger the relationship between the the values of the person, the employee, and and the leader or or the the company owner or the company itself. Um, if those values are aligned and the relationship is strengthened, then you obviously you need a fulcrum, um, to, you know, an everyday thing that goes up and down like a scale, you know. So, yeah, that's that's what I found like in our leadership role um, in teams, uh, and 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 also what I've seen in in my new employees as well. So, um, and 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 it comes to a head when when those values are missing. Yeah, absolutely, Thwaiti. I want to bring up a video uh, of something you did on the field against Sydney a little while ago, um, several years ago now. Mark, can we bring that up? Just going to play this. So you win the ball there and you drop your Dax. What's going on there? How does that fit into your four leadership principles, lady? That's the element of surprise, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you one thing. My wife wasn't too happy. Um, when it was on sunrise the next morning, but uh, why does it take something like that extraordinary <laughs> thing to happen like that to, to get on the news these days? But the funny story is um, the the guy who makes those tights is Body Science and and Greg Young, and uh, they they're actually based here in Burley where I live in, in Gold Coast. So I actually sent to it from I sent it to him one day, and 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 basically of um, yeah I've, I've had free compression gear. Uh, for a lifetime, I think. So, um, yeah, but he's, he's doing really great things. And, um, yeah, I think someone also joked and, and said I look like a Ken doll. So I don't know if that's positive or negative. <laughs> but, yeah, my wife wasn't too happy. Wait, that, that's really interesting, though, because I was going to say that maybe yourself and your agent missed a trick there because you should have had some, you know, some sort of <laughs> signage or something there, something that's a little well, bit more clearer, there, make it a bit well planned. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's an absolute cla- just just for our sort of listeners and, and those that are watch on YouTube. Like, what point were you trying to make to the referee? Uh, look, I was pretty frustrated. Like, obviously, I'd sprint. I, you know, we got counter attacked, and and I sprinted back fifty meters to to get goal side and wrap around him. And uh, yeah, so I was just frustrated at the referee that um, that I, that I got a foul for it because I had worked so hard to get back there. But sometimes you forget that you're playing in front of fifteen thousand on live TV, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm known for those um, little tricks anyway. Mate, you're certainly a bit of a character, and we'll, we'll go into a few of those other points a bit later on. But I want to go back to the, I guess, the, the you called it a fulcrum and, and culture and those four pillars for yourself as a leader. How have they served you well through your footballing career and, and particularly you leading teams? How have people seen you as a leader and demonstrate these four areas that you live by? Yeah, I guess it's more of a process uh, for myself. Uh, so when you wake up or or if you're accepting a job role or accepting a team environment, I know that if I feel that I'm ticking all of those areas, I know that I'll, I'll gain success. And I know that the teams where all the jobs, um, you know, back in the day um, before I was professional, I know that when one of those things was off or, you know, below 50%, um, if you can evaluate yourself every day, um, I know that it was a short-term thing, and uh, I know that the clubs that you know where I felt on the pitch, or even the company now that 
the Gold Coast Rec and Sport, a disability company, I know that you know every day that I wake up and I'm 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 actioning those values. I know that it aligns with the company values, and I know that hopefully that that that'll be a, a long term situation. Just you know, like my relationship. Um, but as I said, like it's an everyday thing. It's not like one game you can have it all perfect, and the next game you know it's going to be perfect. So um, yeah, but those things as well, I think anyone can achieve. And um, you know, you don't need to be Messi or Ronaldo to do those things on the pitch. Obviously, you need to have the technique and you know the awareness, the mentality behind it. But I, I find like if players can do those things, you, you know you're you're more likely have, have a better chance to to winning. Mm. Mate, you reached a, a very high level, obviously playing for the Socceroos, and I think it was something like 14, 13, 14 appearances. So well done there. I'm interested in the the mindset, particularly the behaviours that again you say from about. 12 years of age, you started to think about, you know, I'd really, you know, I want to aspire to be a socceroo. What are those behaviours uh, and maybe even those habits that you had to form in order to reach the pinnacle? Yeah, I mean, I think you can see just behind me, it's one of the, the socceroos jersey that I received um, after going to the first ever Asian Cup in 2007. Um, but that jersey there reminds me when I was younger. I actually never bought the Socceroos jersey when I was growing up because it's something that I wanted to achieve. And then, yeah, just little cues like that um, or, you know, even goal setting, like something that you can physically see or that you want to achieve, um, that, that can help as well. So when I was 18 and, and just moved to Sydney, I wrote like a list of goals and I still have that and I do it in some of my presentations where – you know, I had like kind of a four-year plan. You know, is is you know, maintaining like a scholarship at university. Um, you know, cementing a spot in the university team and getting a trial um, in the national soccer league. So I kind of listed like little short-term goals um, that I could visually see, and then obviously a long-term goal, which was I, I think it was actually going to the Olympics, and I actually got cut before the Olympics. So I kind of reset the goal um, to make the Socceroos, and then within months I was in the Socceroos, but. Those little things like about not buying a jersey or um, just give you those little mental cues and that's something that I was very passionate about when I was you know, when I was younger. So about goal setting and um, again like not, not buying a soccer jersey and, and then that sticks in your mind to when to, to, to try and believe that that, that you want to um, get achieve that result, you know. Such a fantastic story, and I had read that somewhere too before. In that you hadn't bought Socceroos jersey as a, as a kid or or anything, you know, you really wanted to earn it. Can you tell us a bit about how that, I guess, it, achieving that goal, actually, you know, being presented with your Socceroos jersey, like what what was the feelings around that for for you in achieving that? Yeah, I mean, for me, it really started at at, at schoolies. I was at my second schoolies, um, which goes to show anyone can kind of achieve it. So I was actually a, a toolie up in Miss Mission Beach in Cairns. And, you know, my friends were, you know, doing, getting up to mischief. And I, I was watching one of the Socceroos qualifiers against Uruguay. Um, you know, and, and we didn't qualify for, for, for the, for a long time. And, um, you know, it was in that moment where I kind of started visualizing at the TV and, and, and about my future and reflecting that, you know, I've got all this potential um, that I wanted to achieve and I hadn't really um, achieved it. And, um, and it was from that moment where I said, well, the next time we qualify, I'm going to be on that stage. And, you know, within four years, I was on the stage, you know, where we qualified against Uruguay. Um, I didn't play that game, um, but I was in the squad and uh, yeah, we, we qualified for the for the World Cup in the first time in 20, uh, 32 years. So, um, yeah, it goes to show anyone can do it. Um, you know, obviously it's a lot of hard work and sacrifice and moving from Cairns, um, you know, uh, you know, moving to Sydney, which which was a rat race in itself. But yeah, so if you set yourself that process, I think um, you know anything can be achieved. Mm. Mate, one of the topics we also want to cover today is this learning from failure. That's a big thing for you. Do you want to share maybe what you consider as, as failure in your life and then how that turned around and what you learned from yeah, it's that? It's funny, like when reflecting on your career, you know, like the media portray, you know, all these things that you achieved, you know, whether it be 200 games in the A-League or representing the Socceroos on, on, on those occasions, um, you know, but I, I, 
I almost show like a curve of all those achievements. And then the next slide, I show just all the failures that I had, you know, like it's whether it, you know, it come, you know when I was in year 12, I, I got an OP12 um, and I needed to get like an OP10 to get into what I wanted. And, and that was a big failure of mine. That Therefore, I had to stay in Cairns for another year because I wanted to go to a, you know, a bigger university than James Cook in, in Cairns. So, but um, yeah, so like little failures like that. And, and obviously, you know, when I, in, in terms of soccer, you know, I, 12, 13, 14, I was in the state teams and then 15, 16s, I didn't get selected, um, you know, because I, I matured very late um, and, and, and maintained my like psychology to the game and technique. But, and then when I grew into my body and, and, and started believing in myself a lot more, then obviously that technique and, and belief took over. So, um, but I show that curve of how many times I didn't um, get picked. And, you know, for example, like I qualified, I was part of a qualifying campaign of three different World Cups. I didn't go to one World Cup, um, which, which you know, is a, is a big failure of mine. But, um, yeah, to play for the Socceroos for over eight years, um, you know, getting back into the team after after those failures um, is something that I wanted to achieve. And you know, I was part of a salary cap crisis at, um, at Perth Glory. Uh, at Gold Coast United, the club folded under Clyde Palmer after three years. I mean, it takes a lot of motivating um, to, to get through those times. Uh, there was one time during that World Cup in 2006 where I just qualified for that World Cup and... Um, yeah, I had 11 a month uh, FIFA case because uh, I was transferring from Romania to Poland and I ended up missing that World Cup because I hadn't played in such a long time and I was just rusty and not fit, game fit. So um, to go through that as a 22-year-old, um, you know, it stems a lot of failure. Mm. And just touching on the, I guess, the failure of Gold Coast United and, and a young professional footballer, but... I guess in essence, even though you may not have the, the title as captain in the team, but you're a you know, you're a Australian player, so that that brings with it some form of leadership. What sort of how did you perceive yourself in a in a situation like that, and how did you help maybe some of the other players and support them in yeah, a process I mean, like that? It, I was actually captain in that in that third year, and uh, because in the first two years we were doing really well, we had a good, good team, and then. Um, after the second year, Clive uh, obviously was losing a lot of money as, as the A-League clubs do and, and he was kind of pushing for what's happening now, the separation between the APL and, and the FFA um, with Frank Lowy. So he had a, an argument with him, uh, a business argument, and, and we were you know, basically the pawns um, you know, suffering in, in, on TV. And, uh, yeah, it was very hard because basically within three weeks um, we were told to sign over to the FFA uh, and we did that, and I had to lead that whole process with the PFA. And uh, I had, you know, we had a crisis meeting where basically we knew that within weeks the the club would fold. And uh, and 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 after that, the the FFA, FFA announced that the the club would fold, and we all had to look for different um, uh, clubs and and where I signed for Perth Glory. But yeah, it was very frustrating for me. And but I had a very young team because most in that third year at Gold Coast United. A lot of the senior players had chosen to leave to other clubs because they knew, you know, basically we knew in close that, that the club wasn't going to continue in, in that third year because um, the money was going to get pulled out and, you know, the crowds were down. Um, there was constant arguments. So, yeah, it's something that was very hard to achieve. But, yeah, we, I think all of us, apart from Christian Rees, who ended up working for Clive Palmer, um, signed across and most of the guys had kind of opened up other doors um, you know, so they had action, you know, and a great reaction after such failure. So I think that's very important. I want to go into the uh, mental health aspect as well. You know, you've mentioned, you haven't mentioned this interview, but, um, you know, mental health is close to your heart. You've had your own struggles, particularly with anxiety. I guess a situation like that, maybe you've just explained with Gold Coast United and things. What, what how is the mental health side of things impacted you either good or bad uh, or indifferent in your football journey? Yeah, I mean, it's not just in that moment that it's highlighted. It's probably since a child, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm openly stating that, you know, I have suffered from anxiety, um, you know, for for as far as I could know and it probably started as worries as, as a child. Um, yeah, and, and things like that don't help, uh, that's for sure. But, 
you know, if you if you look at the statistics, you know, probably one in four people in Australia suffer from the same cool, uh, effect, and then um, you know, one in seven um, you know suffer from depression in their lifetime. And you know, they're saying eight or nine people now com- committing suicide in Australia every day. And I guess if I compare that to what's going on with COVID, you know, you can see it's it's it should be alarm bells. And um, you know, for me, it really highlighted not just on those points, you know, in, in other clubs, but living away and being in, in and creating like a toxic environment where I was away in China um, and Sydney, where particularly in China, where, you know, it was a different climate, different food, um, you know, different time zone. I was so far away from my family and, and, you know, what I'm used to. And I just put myself into that environment. And that was the really the first time where anxiety kind of slipped into depression. I, I can't really describe what depression is but it was almost like a cloudiness every day um if i can say so and and it was the first time um where where i was having suicidal thoughts um and you know for me i'm openly able to discuss it because i know it's going to help someone else and as i said like anxiety doesn't just change like that it's a day-by-day thing and um but i guess it was that you know you're a product of your environment so um i put myself in into that uh environment and and that's why I came back to Australia and in the A-League, uh, I tried to get into the Brisbane Raw. Uh, they didn't They didn't want a defender. Um, so the closest was West Sydney Wanderers, and, and which was an hour flight away. And then, but even that came to a head as well because you're still in the same kind of environment where you're away from your family and, you know, financially it was an absolute disaster. So, um, yeah, so I'm very passionate about talking about these things and, and hopefully we can make some changes. What helped you get through those dark moments, those cloudy moments? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely my wife and um, and and my family around me. But yeah, like I was when I first came back from China, um, because I'd been on and off medication since my last year at Perth Glory, where I started to see a psychologist about it, and um, but that was kind of broken within my year in China. But when yeah, when I came back. I was very sick, you know, mentally, physically, I was fine. Um, and I love seeing like a psychiatrist, which is a doctor of psychology. And in that meeting, it was, it was quite funny because they were doing analysis and, and, and basically she laughed at me and, and, and I kind of reflected on myself and I kind of laughed at myself like, well, I'm not hospitalized. I don't, you know, I can, I'm physically able. And it was like from that moment, something clicked and like, well, well, maybe I don't need to um, be at this level, you know, because I know how many people are suffering out there. Uh, and are far worse than me, but um, yeah, and then and obviously it's an everyday thing, you know. Like I'm I'm not on medication now, but I'm of I'm trying to come up with resilience patterns um, that 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 I can use every day um, to to get you over those things. And I think you know I think everybody has those anxious moments. It's it's almost like put it on a scale um, where you kind of wake up and sometimes you're five out of ten, sometimes you're nine out of ten, um, but and and different things might trigger those things, but it's about self-regulation um, and, and, you know, continuous in seeing psychologists in, you know, it, it was the information they were giving me was very simple. So I guess something just clicked at, you know, when you're seeing those professionals and, uh, you know, <laughs> there's only one person that's going to resolve it. It's not a textbook. It's not podcast is not what you're looking at it's yourself you know you, you got to resolve it and just like i have in, in in any of the the failures that i've had or um the problems that have occurred so and and that's part of resilience you know not giving up and mm. working out a way finding out a way to win you know you mentioned resilience and resilience patterns what are what are those resilience patterns for you yeah so for me um it actually comes down to what I first talk about, and that's your values. You know, when, when, whenever, whenever I wake up and I'm kind of assessing myself, how do I feel? How am I sleep? Did I eat correctly? Um, and you're kind of, you know, trying to self-regulate about how you're feeling. But I find that as long as I'm achieving all my values each day, whether that be with my work outside of football, whether it be at training, whether it be in my relationship, I find then I have that purpose in life. And I think a lot of people can learn from that and say, you know, like regardless of what happens, the chaos that happens at work or sport or in your relationship, if you have that belief in yourself 
and you find out what your value it doesn't have to be the three C's. You can make up your own. You find out what works and you can wake up every morning and whether that be, you know, in you know, the wants and needs or you know, the, your activity or um, with, with your nutrition, um, you know, what you're giving or what you're taking. I, I think if you can come back to your own values and your self-belief, I think that is the most important part of resilience because it doesn't matter about the environment around you or what other people say to you or whatever it may be. You have that belief in yourself that what you're doing is is, is the right way, and I think that's the key to get over um, you know things like anxiety or um, a problem that, that might may occur in your own life. Mm. I find it often also working with various leaders. It's it's really easy to talk with leaders and they share experiences around you know where they've aligned with their values and stuff like that. And I always like to unpack where have you been challenged? Where have you been challenged in you know, not or, or challenged to live your values. Have you got a, anything that comes to mind there where it's been a real challenge for you? Yeah, the, the hardest thing was for me, um, come you know, in transition because I'm very passionate about about how you know athletes and people transition into it. Because you know, as you know, with COVID, a lot of people have lost their jobs. Um, you know, when athletes retire or they don't make the cut. And, and, you know, all of a sudden you don't have this purpose, you don't have this um, fulfillment about what to do. And there's, it's a real gray area, a real empty feeling. And I think the challenge, you know, in the last two years is to find something that, um, that you align with and that your values align with. And, you know, I wanted to get out of my comfort zone. Uh, that's something that I've learned as a leader. Um, you know, while also still playing, I, I, I worked for an elevator company and it was called Orbit's Elevators and it was in HR. So basically, I was behind um, a computer and in an office, totally outside of my comfort zone. And my alarm bells were ringing like, "Quit, quit, quit!" Every day, "Quit, quit, quit, quit!" I was, you know, I was probably getting paid fifty dollars an hour or whatever. Just and and I went to my boss. I said, "How can you pay me this money?" And you know, I'm not really doing anything. I'm not connecting with people. I'm answering emails. I'm doing presentations. But I, I'm a people person. So basically, I ended up. You know, doing my white card in construction so that I could go into the field because the AFC service and build elevators. And this is like way out of my realm. Um, so I went and did that. And then I started connecting with people and seeing the, the problems that were occurring um, in the field. So then I could bring that back into a report um, uh, into the office. So, and there's always in, in business, there's always that um psychology between the the on pitch and off pitch uh, people you know there's always that bickering and oh these guys aren't working these these guys are working too much there's always as you know like there's there's, there's always that so yeah so that was a real challenge of mine but i kind of um yeah got out of my comfort zone and um yeah and it was because of covid a third of the company got um uh, made redundant which was my role as well, and I actually thanked the boss because I know him through football, and he was one of our sponsors within Gold Coast United. And I just thanked him. Like I was probably one of the only people in the room thanking him, but you know, for that experience. And then, um, and then once COVID occurred, then I started applying for different roles, um, like like everyone else. And uh, that's when I got involved in Gold Coast Recreation and Sports, which which is um, basically. Yeah, helping disability adults um, in the community with with sport and recreation. So, um, and you know, it's opened a whole new can of worms. You know, with 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 my own mindset and um, you know having that purpose within work, and, um, and and I'm also doing like a free disability program within Gold Coast United as well. Yeah, I've seen all, all that, and we're certainly going to go into some of that. But, Mark, I just want to bring something up on the screen, and I just want Thwaity to confirm, is this the is this the after redundancy dance? I think that was, um, as you can see, like, you know, they look after the the, the people of the companies. You know, I've got a, I've got a company <laughs> car. Or, you know, I, had, I, I was ticking all these boxes, but my, my values, it was probably more commitment because I, I didn't understand about elevators. Um, but that was something that I wanted to do. Um, you know, communication was always okay. Compromise, I knew it was flexible for my family. And the surprise, I was always going to give something extra with that company. You know, as you know, as I got into the field and 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 did those extra things, something that they probably didn't expect within human resources. But um, yeah, so 
but it was probably that commitment that that was you know below what I should be as as an athlete or you know as a soccer player. Um, but um, yeah, so for mm. me, it gave me so much experience, and um, but it was very challenging. And 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 now I'm into a a, a very difficult role, but yeah, very valued role um, within sports disability. Mate, let's go into that. Tell us a bit more about that role and how that does along with the values and the impact you're having. And I also want to talk about that's football because I've been sitting here for 30 to 40 minutes with a that's football hat on for those on YouTube watching this. It looks pretty new. I don't think you've worn that there many times. <laughs> Let me say, I'm trying to wear my Central Coast Mariners hat out so that I can put this yeah, one sure. on after that. You have to stay loyal. You have to stay loyal. Well, I am actually a raw supporter first and foremost, but living on the Central Coast, you yeah. can't help but not support oh, the Mariners. And there. fantastic that they're in the uh, in the finals for this yeah, season 100%. as well. So good luck to him on Saturday and night. And he he's done very well. Stadge has done very well to change that culture around. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Yes. Many, many moons ago in our first episode of The Culture of Things, actually spoke to Rosie, Josh Rose, yeah. around his experience with Mariners culture when he was there, I guess what we termed the glory days and then later on. And it was very much chalk and cheese. So yeah, Stadgers obviously done a fantastic job. Yeah. yeah so mate, tell us, tell us a bit about the disability role and, and again, the impact you're having there and, and why you're valuing it so much. Yeah. So I think it's very aligned in what I do. I, I'd say like, since I've, I've, I've been back in, uh, in Gold Coast, you know, I'm basically a family Uber driver and, uh, you know, cause you're, <laughs> you're dropping off going left, right and centre, ballet, horse riding, um, trying to fit in football training. And, um, yeah, so basically I, I applied for this um, for this role as a disability support worker and I, I just, you know, sports um, I've, I've done my whole life. So it's, you know, for me it's, it's, it's not rocket science. Um, and basically, yeah, so on a couple of days a week, I'd, you'd pick up a certain number of clients. So it might be three or four. If you've got a volunteer, it might be five. Um, I've only been driving a little Honda Jazz, so I can only fit so many adults in. Um, but yeah, if you, if you have like more clients, I'll give you a disability van. And basically you'll take them to different sporting events and recreation events uh, within Gold Coast. So there's so much to do here. There's golf, um, you know, netball, baseball, cricket, um, of course, they've got me running a soccer program. So I basically facilitate a program on you know, midweek where everyone kind of comes to me and it's just organized chaos. Um, yeah. So, mm. and, and then you've got like your music, you've got cooking, um, just every, everything that you're passionate about, they bring to the, to the company. And, uh, but obviously you've got to be trained up and qualified as well, which, which, which I'm getting there. And, um, and using my experience because I finished a sports science degree as well whilst I was still playing and obviously got you know qualifications with coaching and things like that. Um, but yeah, so everything you know you can bring, you know, they 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 put you in uh to that program within with within the Gold Coast and uh yeah so and it's flexible hours, you know, they very they're, they're very understanding, uh, which football wasn't really understanding um with family life and, and, and that stuff. So if you need to structure hours um or even work after hours um, and, and they have Sunday off as well. So I'm working part-time. Um, yeah, so basically you, you're running um, yeah, these, these clients around and, and, and facilitating programs and, and just caring for them and, and getting them into the community. You know, a lot of these guys have been through special schools and, you know, socially, um, you know, they're, they're, they're afraid. They haven't had the experience that we have had the joy to to accomplish you know so whether it be catching trains or um going to cafes um you know achieving what they wanted to to do in in, the, in their own goals um yeah so for me it's very it's what i'm doing every day with my family anyway with my kids so um and and then obviously you're trying to learn something new as well which is very important for me because i need that drive to learn something new um, but again, you know, like this, the, the spectrum is so wide, you know, you've got non-verbal, you've got cerebral pause, you've got, um, you know, so many different disabilities, um, you know, mentally, not, not just physically. Um, and it just, yeah, it, it just gives you perspective on, on how good we actually have it, you know, um, in, in society. So, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a real eye for me. I have to say, mate, another mate of mine 
who used to own a cafe, he's gone into disability work and, and he just loves it. And he's that sort of guy. And, and I haven't known you for very long, um, but, you know, trawling through your social media and stuff like that and other conversation, I reckon you would be a super fun disability worker. You must bring so much oh. fun to this role. Yeah, I mean, and, and my wife's in medical um, as well. So, you know, we come home with all these stories and, you know, like I just, you know, like when I when I had my interview and, um, you know, I was doing my volunteer process, um, which I had to go through and it, and it was kind of around COVID time, um, you know, they, I, I just said, you know, like I, I treat these guys like my brother or sister or like my daughter or son, um, you know, like you, you just, you get really attached to them. And they've got so many characters and, you know, it just, it just makes, yeah, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say. I don't know if it's politically, you know, cor correct to say this, but it's almost like, I feel like I'm, I'm the one with the disability, you know? So, um, yeah, because I've, I've always been known as that crazy person on the pitch and off the pitch and, you know, having that character and, um, and, and that's all they are, you know, they just want to be recognized and have, um, the accessible, accessibility like we do you know in society so um but yeah and and, and it kind of aligned to what i was doing as well at Cornish united where we were doing that um accessible program as well so um and with the funding with the ndis and the new announcement with the government i think you know there's um yeah there's so much we can do um extra and as i said like with my values you know I, i'll never let those slip every day that i'm working at that company or in football in, in, in my next chapter. Mm. Mate, I want to bring up another video and this is the sort of fun guy that you are. <laughs> like I said you you We need to do a we need to do a topic on um on social I, media. I so. That's that's part two, Thwaity. But have a look at this. Like he has got the dance moves and this is his daughter there. And I think his daughter's the lead, yeah? <laughs> that's my daughter. What was going on there, mate? Oh, every, every now and then, you know, in those team environments, you know, you get, I get dared to do stuff and I'll never hold back. And I think that was the WAP dance. I don't want to, I don't want to um, tell you what it stands <laughs> for, but I learned so much from my, my children. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I'd say that every six months I get dared to do stuff either on live TV or, um, <laughs> on, but yeah, look, to be honest, the social media aspect is really bothering me because that was one of the things that um, put me into that, you mm. know, toxic environment when I was away. And, you know, I, I never used to post about my career, to yep. be honest, un until I signed up for Instagram. It was one of my teammates told me to sign up when I was in China. And I was nonstop on Instagram, nonstop, just in that wormhole. And I'm sure we've all been there. But, yeah, it's, it's something that I'm looking to mold out of. But as a business, like I'm on Instagram, um, with that football, but it's just something that I'm stuck between because as a business, you can really suffer if you're not out there and not giving the right messages. But in the same breath, for my anxious mind, it doesn't really work mm. um, for me. So I'm, I'm really, it's, it's like a double-edged sword, you know. So I'm thinking about, you know, going old school and you know, going cold turkey with the whole thing because it doesn't do me any justice. Like it's, it's, there's a lot of validation there that I don't need because I know what I've achieved. Um, you know, what I say is, is what I've actually done. Um, and I'm so content with what I've achieved in, and, and which is a main reason why I did finish playing as well, because of, I, I couldn't see myself achieving anything more. Yeah. I think you certainly do come across as a pretty content guy and a guy that's always willing to have a bit of a laugh at yourself, uh, which is fantastic. And that, that's what I've seen through your social media is just having a bit of a laugh, really, enjoy looking at it. <laughs> really enjoying that second life of yours as a slave with your family and being the family Uber driver and stuff like that, mate. So, but you were so right, you know, social media is one of those things that can grab you strongly and you can get sucked into that vortex and that cesspit if you let it. Yeah. And I'm worried about my gen my next generation, you know, like my, my kids, you know, cause we were lucky we had the, the balance between both. So mm -hmm. maybe we're a little bit better with self-regulating and, and that self-control of not being on it. Um, but from what I see in schools and, um, you know, the, the, the next generation of players, you know, everything's kind of promoted and it's all about that likes and loves and what, what not. And it's all about just self-validation. Like, it's like, do you really need that? Um, to, and, and then the, the, the way they communicate, they, I don't think they know how to, communicate with um, people these days and if you're going for a job interview or 
you're looking to get into a new team, that'll come to a head, you know, quick smart if you can't communicate. And um, but people are hiding behind their devices, you know. Mate, tell us a bit about That's Football because that's the other passion of yours and something you create a mentorship um, business and program and, and even just what we've spoken about there on social media. How are you looking to to create That's Football into something that's really valuable for young people and this, and this transition from sort of whatever they're in into something else? Yeah, so it's, it's a mentoring company helping people transition into a profession that they value. I, th- I think so many people out there and i'm more exposed to it now like in the real world but so many people out there are in jobs that they just do not like they're hating life you know and and i never really understood that i I guess i had a little bit of that you know i had a privileged job at at alberts elevators and um you know where you're getting paid well and you're getting looked after cars but something was missing there and but i think people just go like their whole lives like that and um, for me, like for 18 years, I was paid to to play and do what I love since I've I've known. And it, and it, you know, as much as my wife probably won't know, but I'm going to be doing something within soccer until I'm dead. You know, 88 years old. So I think um, you know, that's that's something I, I just don't understand why people um are in roles or they're studying in in degrees that they don't want to do or their parents have portrayed and. And that's a big passion of mine, and 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 I want to resolve that transition, you know, where you do feel that emptiness. And I, I can just say it's from it's that empty feeling of of transition, you know, when you're losing jobs or you're looking to, you know, going from year twelve, looking to get into a career. It's it's a real empty feeling, you know, that that transition. So, um, and and it's that cycle that we've just spoke about on 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 this during this session, you know, where. You're having to introduce yourself. You're learning about your values, and then obviously, you know, you're setting goals to what what you want to achieve. And then, you know, when you're achieving those goals, then you tend to be in more of a leadership role. And then, obviously, as leaders, we fail so much. And uh, what do you do with that failure? It, it obviously, you know, it snowballs into some sort of mental health where it might be anxious moments, it might lead into depression, or or even worse um, than that, how we've spoken about. And then. You know that final cycle of resilience getting through the thing so i think that i've kind of created like that with my topics as well that transition cycle um that that we go through whether you're going to get into something that you actually value or you don't um so yeah so that's my little side passion i kind of folk because I'm, I'm i'm doing a lot of different things plus trying to commit to the family um i was very consumed by football and that's one thing that i would never let myself do so whether it be if if that's football takes off, I'm not. It's not going to be my sole focus. Mm. Um, that's why I'll always have something else, and I think that balance is important um, because, as you know, like if you focus on one thing, whether it be you know be, becoming a vegan or whatever, it can be very dangerous. You know, so um, I think it's good to have that balance, which you know, um, which we which we've been talking about. Mm. Your wife Chantelle, was she into football when she met you? You know, you guys met when you were quite young, didn't you? No, not at all. Yeah, we we were, we were, we actually went to high school together. Um, but I I don't know if it's unfortunately or fortunately, I actually broke up with her after two uh, two or three weeks because I was so scared. I was so immature. Um, at, I did at see our... that somewhere. You'd written about it somewhere, or somebody had written it about you. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, I actually broke up with her because I was just scared. I thought it would affect my football, and I just had all these things that I wanted to achieve. And um, Yeah, but in hindsight, it probably, <laughs> probably shouldn't have. But, yeah, we had a, 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 a five-year break, and she went off to Brisbane. I went to Sydney. And then, um, yeah, and then five years later, she ended up being single, and, um, she moved back to Cairns and I was on uh, a winter a break from Romania and we went to the same nightclub and I kind of saw her there and um, and then from that moment, like, yeah, we, were all, we weren't really committed and then, um, yeah, from about the end of 2005 and the start of 2006 and I was still contracted in, in Romania, um, yeah, that's when we committed and, you know, as, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend and then, yeah, Ever since then, we've we've been together, and um, yeah, it's been a long journey because obviously you're starting. I'm in Europe, and she's in Cairns, and 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 football brings so much, you know, politics and movement, and oh, it's just it's hard. It's so much compromised, you know. So, mm. um, but yeah, we're we're 
this 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 time in Gold Coast has been really good for us. It's the first time we've actually been probably settled because I think that's what she wanted. She just wanted to settle, and um, and it's probably the longest period that we've had in a city, you know, which is I think it's five years. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 been a long journey, um, and there's so much more. You know, you our girls want to achieve things as well, and um, and and then that's one. That's one thing about Chantel, you know, like because a lot of football players, partners, you know, they don't work and, you know, they're, they're having to follow the, the player all around. And, you know, she was a nurse before a sonographer. So it's it's outstanding that she even maintained those degrees and maintain her hours with work. Otherwise, she would have lost. Um, yeah, that's one thing actually she, she does <laughs> resent me for is she actually lost her nursing because she, she transitioned into a sonographer, but... She needed like one month during like heavy A League scheduling when I was in Perth to to get her hours up for nursing, and and she ended up losing her nursing qualification because I couldn't you know I couldn't commit to that because it was in January in the A League, so it was like it was hard to to balance. And uh, but yeah, she's got a good job now, but those arguments do come up uh, because yeah, she 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 made such a great nurse uh, mm. before and. But it's maybe it's something that she'll go back, but it means like she's got to study a few more years to get it back, which is unbelievable that you even need to do that, you know? So. Mm. Well, like any good partner, mate, I'm sure that you will live with that memory for the rest of your life <laughs> and I'll make sure that you don't forget that. Oh, yeah, don't worry about that. As I said, it's an everyday thing with those um, with those values. <laughs> and and how do you, you, you sort of, it's 3v1, you know, you've got three females in your house first. How do you... How do you cope with that? Well, I've got my dog Coffee, who's in the uh, who's in the room. Are these Coffee's thing. male? Uh, yeah. So my dog Coffee. Yeah. If 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 yeah, if shit hits a fan, then I, we normally go go out for a walk or go for a bike ride and remove myself from the environment. But um, yeah, normally I'm the problem, to be honest, because <laughs> I'm a male. I can only do one thing at a time. Yes, mate. At least we can. You and I, we can admit to that. And that's fine. <laughs> a lot of a lot of males can't admit to that. <laughs> Still living in uh, in false hope, I think, mate. What's the? You, you've mentioned a number of things during this interview, but if you could pick one thing that was the greatest challenge, the biggest challenge for you and the journey, whether that be you know challenge for the family, whatever, as a, being a professional footballer, what what is that single biggest challenge that you've had throughout your career? Um. Yeah. I mean, the hardest. The hardest phase in my career was was missing that mm. 2006 World Cup, and um, yeah, and 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 I was I was mentally ready to go because I was 22 years old. I was the I was the youngest um, in that team in 2005, and you know under Gus Hiddink, I just made my debut in October, and um, you know we won five nil against against Jamaica, and then you're part of the, the November qualifiers and. Yeah, you're in this successful team and um, you're going to the World Cup. And then, yeah, and then when I returned to Romania um, and they, the president saw so much value in myself, you know, I think they they said, you know, because I was, I was still contracted um, until mid-2006 um, um, and they saw that value, you know. They, they I, I think they said, you know, one or two million euro it's going to take if, if to transfer and... But I was over Romania, a two-year contract, and then I actually signed in January a pre-contract with Wisła Krakow in Poland with Dan Petrescu, who used to play for Chelsea. And uh, he was Romanian. And uh, yeah, and then ever since I signed that, pro, that pre-agreement, which was you know probably not a wise thing to do, they stopped me playing and then they made it really hard. And, and as I said, like I had to take the whole case to FIFA and I was just so young and very narrow-minded and I just, you know, in hindsight, maybe I should have just extended or um, just been patient and kept playing and um, maybe had a better chance to go for that 2006 World Cup. Um, and, yeah, but in the same breath, you know, when you know, we qualified for the 2014 World Cup and, you know, Holger Osik lost his job and, um, and, and Ange came in and, and he wanted to bring in the youth and, um, the players that he wanted, and uh, yeah, so sometimes it's not meant to be. Um, but as I said, like growing up to to represent Australia even one time um, and play one game 
Paul Marconi in the NSL. Uh, mm. I could have died a happy person. So what's your greatest highlight in your career, mate? Uh, greatest highlight would definitely be, uh, yeah, one of those two, you know, either re- you know representing um, Australia because that, that jersey meant so much. Um, yeah, that first jersey for Australia and, you know, just seeing the signatures on it, you know, like Mark Maduka, Harry Kuehl, uh, Lucas Neal, Mark Swartzer, uh, there's there's too many to name, um, and 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 yeah, just to just just to get that first Socceroos jersey, that that yellow jersey, and um, you know to put it on and just look at yourself and just freaking out, um, and yeah, just just for it to, all to go well to plan and and to get a, a win was was amazing feeling, and uh, you know no one can take it away from you. Um, but I had the same feeling, you know, getting my first. Uh, professional contract and my first professional game for Marconi as well. Yeah, so many highlights, mate. You've played in so many teams and you've also now been part of organisational teams as well. For you, what makes a great team player? Yeah, for me, it, you know, it has to it has to be about commitment. Um, and I've seen a lot of players that that are not committed and, and for one reason or the other, but um, it's like in anything. If 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 you don't believe in that team or that coach, or um, you know, it's it's going to be very short term. And you know, I, you know, I've been at I've played football in thirty five different countries, and um, you know, all for free, and and an amazing experience. So many cultures, so many people, so many different languages, and and. Uh, yeah, for me, it comes down to really believing, and and whether it be you as a coach or you as a player, believing in yourself. And because if you don't believe in yourself, people will smell it from the start, and and they will take advantage of it. Um, and 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 but yeah, that's that that that's the main message is to believe in yourself, and and obviously the 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 resilience part is just not giving up. You know, like if because. Is that even with my company now, like I can't say that it's a a fantastic mentoring company and earning so much money, and um, but I'm losing a lot of money. But it's and, and there's so many times where I just want to give up and just stop the business completely. But something always keeps me going, and uh, that's a belief in what I what I want to say and and talk to people about because um, it's important in, in in their lives, in my own lives, in my everyday life. So. Um, yeah, believe in yourself and never give up. That, that, that's that's the that's a very important in in, in any culture. Mm. So, what does that future look like for you, mate? What's the what's the next five, ten years? What sort of impact are you hoping to have? Yeah, I mean, I'm probably doing it. Like, I think um, I, I want both to kind of remain part time. I don't want it to be a full time thing. Um, I want to be flexible for my family in the next five years because, you know, they're 12 and nine. So the next five years is very important for them for their own transition. And, um, yeah, and, and that's, you know, like we're, we're looking to build things uh, disability-wise at the club. I'm still training um, a couple of nights, even though the coach still wants me to play at United. And But the weekends are just so hectic with my family. And um, I definitely in the next five years, I, I want to – I, I want to go to as many schools as possible. Uh, I want to start talk, talking to, to, to clubs here in the Gold Coast. But, um, you know, my first real That's Football Talk was at Sydney University because I still got a great relationship with them, um, being one of the Blues Foundation um, there. And, you know, I was I was away from my family overnight. Um, I had a couple of drinks, didn't, didn't have the best sleep, um, didn't eat well, and I woke up. Um, very early to catch a, a, a flight back to, to Gold Coast. And I'm thinking, do I really want to put myself in the same position as I was as a player, traveling here and there, being away from the family? So I think in the next five years, it's got to be local um, and, and everything struck, structured around my family because it hasn't, hasn't been like that, you know, for a long time. Mm. But I also want to ask you around uh, sort of taking a few sideways steps, but you captain – the Queensland football team back in 2020 recently or, you know, 12 months or so ago. Yeah. What does it mean to captain your state side? You know, Queensland are really passionate. Yeah. 
for me, that was that was kind of that fulfillment that I got where this this could potentially be my last game because I was I was I made the announcement to my own team at the start of 2020 before COVID and and we had that big break in COVID so everyone was kind of saying well you're going to play next year you're definitely going to be playing the season was muddled and um, but it was that when I represented because I collect jerseys as well not just like Socceroos jerseys I've got maybe 60 jerseys in my back um, in, in the back room. Uh, that's another argument for my wife as well. But every, Who cleans them? <laughs> every jersey has a story. But this jersey, this Queensland jersey, means so much to me because I had so much failings when I was, you know, 15, 16, 17, where I wasn't getting picked for that Queensland team. And, uh, you know, I was getting shadow. And uh, But for me, that jersey, it means everything because I, I played at one junior club for 10 years at St. Soccer Club, the Queensland team. I live in Queensland. I, you know, when people ask me what football team do you support, I passionately support Broncos, and and I've, I've done since the start. And um, you know, I love watching the Origin. I'm going to the Origin too uh, with with my brother-in-law. Yeah, those. It doesn't have to be football, but th- that jersey meant so much to me. And um, I remember, yeah, just walking out and leaving the team. We actually, yeah, talking about failure, we. We ended up copying a, a goal in the, the last minute of normal time uh, and then went to extra time. It was 2-2 and we went to penalties. I actually stepped up and I missed my penalty. So in my last kick of, uh, of, of, uh, of semi-professional <laughs> or, or, or football, I missed my penalty. So there's, there's, the, there's the key. Just life goes on. And uh, But, yeah, to wear that Queensland jersey was was amazing, and 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 it brought me a lot back to my my childhood. Mate, do you remember the first penalty you ever ever missed? Uh, I don't think I missed one before <laughs> before that. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I scored one in the A League, and then um, yeah, I don't think I missed a penalty. So that was, but if I had it again, I'd definitely miss it again. That's for sure. Because no one else is putting their hand up. <laughs> I only ask because, mate, mine was back when I was under 10s and it still scars me today. I, I don't think I've, I've taken a penalty since. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard thing, you know, like a lot, a lot of people. Uh, but for me, it was time. Uh, I could have easily just played again this year. and um, you know, But it, it means taking away from my family, like not, not seeing my daughters perform at ballet or jazz or, um, you know, the Sunday – just gone. I, I'm just, you know, doing disability program, and then I rolled into going to horse riding all day. And you know, we're collecting poo, and I was working in the canteen, cooking sausages and deep frying. But you do it for your daughters, you know, mm. to be part of their community. And um, our parents did it for us, so um, I would sacrifice that rather than going to Mackay this weekend with 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 the team, you know. So um, it's that compromise. Absolutely, mate. And look, I, I want to pull up one last video, I think, and that's uh, oh, no. it's, 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 <laughs> Mark, we're going to show this one through. It's only 15 seconds or so, but I'm really interested in this celebration at the end. So this is a goal you've – great header, by the way. <laughs> so from a corner, have a look at this. Do you remember what, – what's that celebration about, Twaney? Yeah, so yeah, I'll talk. You you're very passionate about culture of things, and um, yeah, so that that's from my region in in Cairns. Um, I don't have any Aboriginal blood in myself, uh, but yeah, so it's from. We used to have a dance company that came to our primary schools and high schools called Jabakai. It's actually gone under now, I think, uh, with after COVID, and which is very disappointing. Mm-hmm. But it it kind of means the region of the mountains um, surrounding um, Cairns and. It's very passionate myself, and so they used to do that Aboriginal and Torres Strait dance as well. So um, I know I don't have it in my blood, but it's definitely in my body. So um, and and the funny story is, I, I as I said, I, I scored three times in in China for Liaoning and against some big teams there. I did that celebration, and the whole stadium was booing me because they thought it was like obviously a threat to them, you know. Yeah. So they didn't really understand it, but then I explained. You know that I did that um, that Jabakai dance and um, yeah, so yeah, it's 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 a big passion. As I said, you never forget where you grew up and um, 
yeah, it always reminds me of Cairns. And, and I love, yeah, I love when I see those dances and um, all the tribalness that comes from it, you know, the NRL and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's great. Fantastic, mate. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mate, do you want to just share sort of last final thoughts around particularly, you know, we are a leadership teamwork culture podcast and we've, we've touched on all of those factors today in your own experience. What would you say to people uh, leading organisations or leading teams out there based on your own experience that can help them become better leaders and have a greater impact? Yeah, I think that there was a good quote on leadership. Um, I don't know it term by term, but it was from Nelson Mandela about just, you know, putting the team before yourself. And, um, and, and then obviously if, if, um, you know, if, if trouble happens or bad things happen or um, negative things happen within the company, then the leader steps forward and, and takes responsibility. And I think that's the best form of leadership for, for me. Um, and uh, yeah, but the main thing is with leaders is, is action, you know, and, and obviously belief in, in what you're saying because, yeah, if, if your work is underneath you or, or above you or however your business is structured, um, if, if they get a sense of, that lack of belief, then yeah, it will definitely come to a head. But yeah, I've always been a leader that, that tries to action, you know, like, you know, we talk a lot, but um, it's, it's difficult to action. Um, so I think that's, that's probably a great part of leadership, but yeah, mainly, mainly is uh, the team before yourself. And that's how I've always tried to operate. So true, mate. Thank you for sharing. Mate, how can people get hold of you? Um, yeah, again, on social media, I'm, uh, that's football mt um uh, at instagram and uh, but yeah <laughs> i'm at heads with uh with facebook and uh, for me it doesn't work too well um and it wastes a lot of my time but yeah i i, I do tr try and promote uh different things and different ways of thinking and just see what 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 i'm doing during the during the day and um at schools and clubs and um yeah so at instagram for now um to be confirmed. <laughs> awesome, mate. Look, mate, thanks very much for your time today. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I, I remember watching various games of, of yours over your career and I always had this vision in my head of the, the smiling assassin, you know, this really tough defender at the end, but always, always had a smile on your face. So, and I've seen that as I got to know you a little bit more, you're, you're just a, a great fun loving sort of guy um, who's really in touch with himself as an individual, has some great family values and some general values that guide your life. So mate, I really appreciate the conversation, and the time you've taken today. Thanks for being a guest on the Culture of Things podcast. Thank you very much, Brennan. I, I really appreciate the time. And, uh, yeah, I, I think Andy Harper used to call me that, the smiling assassin. Because, and, uh, yeah, I, I got a lot of yellow cards. I actually got, in my last full professional game, another failure. I got uh, my first ever red card for West Sydney Wanderers, and that was my last A-League game. And it's something that I prided myself on because I had copped a lot of yellow cards uh, from mm. that smile. But, um, yeah, I mean, every time you smile, a good thought comes into your head and uh, it, it's a positive way to, to talk to people as well, um, with laughter and smiling. And um, yeah, it's, it's good to be positive, isn't it? Absolutely, mate. A great smile uh, brightens up lots of people's days, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Pleasure, mate. Chatting with Thwaiti, it's easy to get a feel for his outwardly carefree nature, his ease at talking with people, and his propensity for a laugh. What's harder to know, and what he shared today, is his inner thoughts and struggles with mental health, particularly anxiety. True leaders share their vulnerabilities. Thwaiti's achieved so much in his career, and I'm sure he'll achieve just as much in life after football once he can take a break from being the family Uber driver. These were my three key takeaways from my conversation with Thwaiti. My first key takeaway, leaders know what they stand for. The majority of leaders I've worked with find it very difficult to articulate what they stand for. If you don't know what you stand for, how can anyone you lead know? Thwaiti's very clear on his values he calls them the three C's, communication, compromise, and commitment, with an element of surprise. 
Having this level of clarity drives your everyday decisions and it makes it clear to everyone what you stand for. My second key takeaway, leaders believe in themselves. They've got a quiet inner confidence and know if they take the right actions every day, it's only a matter of time. It never comes across as arrogance. It's simply a humble belief in their own ability. My third key takeaway, leaders earn their stripes. I love the story how Thwaiti never bought a Socceroos jersey. He wanted to earn it, and he did. In leadership, respect is earned. It should never be something that's just handed to you based on a title. So in summary, my three key takeaways were, leaders know what they stand for. Leaders believe in themselves and leaders earn their stripes. If you enjoyed the episode, leave a comment down below. To make sure you don't miss any of our episodes, remember to click the subscribe button and hit that notification bell. Thanks for watching, stay safe, until next time.